Good morning. Uh, my name is Thomas Lee. I'm one of the perinatologists at Northwest Perinatal Center. And today I'm going to be talking about routine cervical length surveillance in the OB patient as part of our MFM Express Didactics Lecture Series, or as we dub it, the uh, MedX. So first off, why do we do cervical length measurements at all? What I've presented in front of you is an illustration from Jay Imes' uh, landmark paper from 1996 out of the New England Journal. Uh, this is from a prospective study looking at transvaginal cervical length measurements um, in about uh, 3,000 women. And as you can see, there, uh, with a the normal uh, curve there, um, there is a normal distribution of bell-shaped curve uh, as to the normal cervical length that you see in the general population. What this study showed, though, was that, and as most people know at this point, that as the cervix gets shorter, the risk for preterm delivery increases substantially the shorter that it gets. So, in essence, that is why it's important to examine the cervical length during the second trimester, primarily because we're, the point is to try to identify patients who are really at the highest risk for preterm birth, and then subsequently to offer evidence-based interventions to either prevent, delay, or prepare for preterm delivery. So that's the point of cervical length measurement in general. So when do we typically perform cervical length measurements? Usually this is recommended between 16 and 24 weeks. The reason we don't perform these before 16 weeks is that at uh, earlier gestational ages, the little uterine segment is relatively undeveloped, and, and so it's very difficult to distinguish between the lower uterine segment and the endocervical canal. Additionally, um, these uh, measurements have really not been shown to be beneficial in identifying those patients who really are at increased risk for preterm birth. So the clinical utility of this measurement before 16 weeks is, is, is low. We also don't typically perform these after 24 weeks, and, and really this is just more convention, primarily because the studies of subsequent interventions such as cerclage and vaginal progesterone have most often used 24 weeks as the upper gestational age limit for screening, and so really most of the studies don't look at what to do with cervical lengths after 24 weeks when you're doing it for routine screening. So the take home message here is 16 to 24 weeks is the appropriate time to do cervical length screening. Um, as an aside, cervical length measurements can also be used to assess uh, patients who potentially are in preterm labor. That in itself is a whole different can of worms and really outside the scope of today's short talk um, and definitely something that we can talk about in the future. But uh, just so you know that there is that modality and the, the ability to use that, uh, at that at later gestational ages. So who do we use cervical length screening and how do we uh, use it? Well, as most people know, for patients who have a prior history of spontaneous preterm birth, um, transvaginal cervical length screening is recommended and also offering a, a 17 uh, hydroxyprogesterone caparate um, as uh, therapy for prevention, um, this is recommended starting at about 16 weeks and up until 24 weeks. Typically, we start this uh, at a frequency of every two weeks, and we can increase the fre frequency if we do uh, identify cervical shortening. So definitely in patients who have a prior history of preterm delivery, transvaginal cervical length evaluation should be recommended and performed. But what about the rest of the population? Um, so currently there is a lot of debate on whether or not universal transvaginal cervical length screening, even without a history of prior preterm delivery, uh, should be performed. Um, some authors do recommend this, uh, but definitely this is an area of much controversy within the perinatal field. So when we consider kind of whether or not to introduce this as a standardized protocol, I think there are some things that we need to consider. First and foremost, when you're talking about your patient population, what really is the incidence of clinically significant cervical shortening, um, again, in your patient population? 
Um, when I say clinically significant, I use, or most of us use, the cervical length less than or equal to 20 millimeters. And the reason for that is, is that that is the threshold at which you are going to potentially offer therapy such as vaginal progesterone, which has been shown to uh, possibly reduce risk for preterm birth in the 30 to 35 percent range. But as you, uh, as you may know, nationally, the incidence in the general population of cervical shortening is actually only 1 to 2 percent of the general population. So that's a, a relatively small percentage of the population. And anecdotally, in the Pacific Northwest, what we have seen is that that rate is actually lower than the national average, our rate is. Um, additionally, we want to look at, well, what is the spontaneous preterm birth rate in general in your patient population? As most of you know, Portland and the Oregon region have the lowest rates of preterm birth in the country. Um, as a result, the incidence of what we're trying to screen for is relatively low. So as we uh, evaluate how to go about cervical length screening in our patient population, these are things that definitely we want to consider. Additionally, think about the cost of universal transvaginal screening. This is a substantial uh, increased cost to the patient and to the healthcare system in general. And so is this a worthwhile endeavor to incorporate universal transvaginal screening? And then finally, think about the impact upon the patient in terms of inconvenience and discomfort. And additionally, is this something that we can roll out in our uh, practice from an operational perspective? So all of the things that we have tried to consider when we evaluate whether or not to use transvaginal cervical length screening in the general population. And the answer is no, that's not what we are recommending currently. So may, you may ask yourself, well, then what is the other option? So the other option is actually transabdominal screening. And so um, here is a study from March of 2013 out of the University of Pennsylvania. So what they did was evaluated what is the ability of transabdominal cervical length screening to identify those patients who are at uh, increased risk of having a transvaginal cervical length, again, less than that uh, 20 millimeters. And so as you can see, um, at different cutoffs below which you would then subsequently do transvaginal screening, um, there are different sensitivities. And, and so um, as you see, the sensitivity does gradually in increase and actually kind of uh, stabilizes here and then goes all the way up to 100%. Um, additionally, the negative predictive value across the board is actually relatively good. So, um, as you know, for any screening test, you want to make sure that you're identifying those patients, um, at least optimally, uh, who have the condition or the thing that you're looking for, but you can't do it in such a way that you're screening everybody as a result of it. So what we have chosen, and this was a consensus among the uh, MFMs, is to use a transabdominal cerv uh, cervical length measurement of 30 millimeters as the threshold, at which point um, subsequent transvaginal screening should be done. So this is a um, the uh, NWP cervical length protocol. This has been out for about uh, two years, and I went everyone to kind of focus on um, the left column. Um, the other two columns are patients who have had a history of uh, preterm birth. And again, it's recommended that these patients undergo more frequent transvaginal cervical length screening starting at 16 weeks. But if you look at singletons and multiples who don't have a history of prior preterm delivery, what we do again recommend is a single abdominal cervical length measurement at the time of the second trimester anatomy survey. If it's greater than 30 millimeters, we don't want to do anything further. If it's less than or equal to 30 millimeters, then subsequently these patients should have a transvaginal cervical length. Additionally, patients in whom we can't obtain a transabdominal cervical length should then have a transvaginal assessment. If they are less than 20 millimeters, um, then we offer them pr prometrium or vaginal progesterone therapy. If they, it's greater than 20 millimeters, then we don't do anything at all. So over here, we have actually the concept of multiples. What do we do in multiples? And you may also ask, well, what do we do with the other patients who traditionally and historically we've gotten transvaginal cervical lengths, um, patients 
such as uh, patients who have a history of LEAP or cervical cone, or how about uterine anomalies? And so what I'd like to finish off with is what we currently recommend for that group of patients who historically we've ordered transvaginal cervical length surveillance on. So if you look at multifetal pregnancies, and this is from the preterm prediction study by the NICHD back in uh, 1996, so over two decades ago, what they found was, and as everybody knows, the risk of preterm birth is increased in patients who have twins, actually an eightfold increased risk compared to singletons. And what we do see is that the length of the cervix actually is shorter in general uh, in 18% of twins versus 9% of singletons. The problem in this case is that with twins, nothing has been shown to be effective therapy. So as a result, should we be screening more aggressively in a patient population in which we have nothing necessarily that we have to offer to them to help reduce the chance of preterm delivery? And um, the answer is probably not. So the current recommendation, both by SMFM and by subsequently Northwest Perinatal, is that multifetal pregnancy should not undergo routine transvaginal cervical length evaluation. We will continue to do transabdominal cervical length evaluation. And if there is uh, a cervical length shortening, that's when we get the MFM involved because, yes, that's where it comes down to customized care. Okay? So... Um, the take-home message here is don't order transvaginal cervical lengths on your twins going forward. Okay, so how about patients who have uh, a history of cervical cone and LEAP procedures? Because, again, historically, these are patients whom we've ordered cervical length surveillance on transvaginally. Um, if you look at multiple studies, and I just put a couple up there, um, looking at both cervical cone and LEAP, in actuality, the increased risk associated with prior cervical surgery is only about a two-fold increased risk of preterm birth, okay? So that is not a significantly substantial enough increase that would suggest uh, uh, a need for more aggressive uh, uh, surveillance. Um, again, with cervical cone, relative risk clusters around two. Uh, similarly, with LEAP, uh, we're only seeing a... a not even a doubling of the rate of preterm birth in, in these various studies. And so the bottom line here is, is that um, SMFM, and again, we uh, agree that uh, patients who have a history of cone and leap do not require any additional evaluation um, beyond what you would typically recommend for the general population. And so again, since we don't do universal transvaginal screening, that would imply that we screen these patients by transabdominal route. And then lastly, what about patients who have uterine anomalies? Should we be performing transvaginal cervical length in them? And the answer is in general, no. So this is a study uh, from 2005 out of Philadelphia, um, looking at the overall incidence of preterm birth in uh, patients with various uterine anomalies. And, and as you can see, um, the overall incidence of preterm birth under 35 weeks is only about 11%, so not dramatically higher than the general population. Most of our patients are going to have either bicornuate uteruses or septate uteruses. And again, the risk for preterm birth and also the incidence of cervical shortening is really not that dramatically higher than the general population. Um, you can make an argument to suggest that potentially unicornate or didelphus uteruses may require a little bit of uh, increased surveillance. And I think that, again, that's controversial. But in general, because the risk isn't that high in uh, patients with uterine anomalies, we do not recommend transvaginal cervical length anymore for patients who have uterine anomalies in general. So, Really, to conclude, here are the take-home messages that I'd uh, like you to remember. So who should we be performing cervical length surveillance on? Well, really, we should be doing it in all patients in the second trimester, typically between 16 and 24 weeks. Um, and then how should we go about doing it? Well, transvaginal cervical length evaluation should be performed in patients who have a history of a prior spontaneous preterm birth, um, as most everybody knows. Um, if that trans 
Abdominal Im uh, image uh, suggests a cervical length less than 30 millimeters. Those patients should be then getting a, a reflex transvaginal cervical length. And then finally, those patients who we just can't evaluate the cervix transabdominally should also have a, a transvaginal exam. Everybody else should be screened using transabdominal cervical length, and that includes, again, patients who have multifetal pregnancies, uh, patients who have a history of leap and cone, and patients have, who have uterine anomalies. 